The 2023 climbing season on Nanga Parbat was hectic as mountaineers from all over the world attempted to summit the ninth tallest mountain in the world. A few climbers would be successful, but their stories are overshadowed by the controversy and shortcuts made by commercial expeditions during their summit pushes. Experienced and beginner climbers all struggled to safely reach the summit in return, with many having to be hospitalized or helped off the mountain. However, one story highlights these mistakes more than all the others. This is the story of Pavel Kopak and the 2023 climbing season of Nanga Parbat. When attempting to climb an 8,000 meter peak, there are a few options for any individual. The solo choice is by far the most expensive, requiring you to coordinate all the preparations yourself, seek the proper government approvals, and outsource any help desired. This option is rarely taken, and if pursued, it is only done by the most experienced individuals. Another choice is to team up with other experienced mountaineers, where you rely on the skills of each other and share the costs. These type of expeditions are common when attempting to complete a specific goal. Think of 14 peaks on Netflix with Nims Perja. Lastly, and the most common way to climb an 8,000 meter peak is through commercial expeditions. Commercial expeditions will provide individuals with the team, supplies, and the proper documentation needed. These can have varying costs with a wide variety of assistance provided. The more money one is willing to pay will result in more assistance and luxuries provided. Almost all commercial expeditions are responsible for planning the climb as well as the route. The only expectation for individuals signing up is that they are sufficient mountaineers who fully understand the risk of attempting something as challenging as reaching the summit of an 8000er. But what happens when the mountaineers did everything right and the commercial expeditions took a shortcut, causing an increase in risk for all climbers? Who takes responsibility then? Or more importantly, what is being done to prevent this from happening again? Nanga Parbat stands as the ninth tallest peak in the world and is one of 14 8,000 meter mountains on our planet. It is the westernmost major peak in the Himalayas and is notorious for being an extremely difficult climb, so much so that it has earned the nickname Killer Mountain for its high number of fatalities. Statistically, one in five climbers who successfully summit will die. It stands as one of the ultimate challenges for any elite mountaineer. Take a look at Pavel Kopak's Facebook page, and within seconds it is clear that the man loved to be in the outdoors. His page is filled with photos of excursions into the forest, venturing into a cave, or climbing a mountain. Originally from Poland, he lived in the southern city of Kielce, being an avid mountaineer. Pavel was a part of the Sviatokreski Mountaineering Club, and had successfully summited Monoslu in 2019. After a failed attempt to climb Lhotse in 2021, the climber set his eyes on Nanga Parbat. There are many different expeditions on the Killer Mountain for the 2023 climbing season, but the most popular one was Seven Summits Trek. In previous years, the expeditions coordinated with each other to share campsites and supplies, and this year would be no different. About a month was spent between porters and climbers establishing the route in high camps. This year on Nanga Parbat, the expeditions would be following the popular Diamir West Face route. However, unlike previous seasons, commercial teams didn't try to set up a fourth camp, which typically lies around 7,400 meters. Instead, they launched their summit pushes from Camp 3 at 6,800 meters. Now, this might be okay for many climbers on Supplementary O2, but it is a long haul for those without extra gas, and there were a number of them. Pavel Kopak traveled to the Himalayas with two other Polish climbers. They would lean on each other for support, but ultimately each man would be climbing individually and at different times. They would not be guided by Sherpas, nor did the men plan to use supplemental oxygen. Pavel and the other Polish climbers would arrive in the Himalayas before June and begin their acclimation trips to become accustomed to the high altitude terrain. After weeks of hard preparations and adjustments, the men were anxiously waiting for their summit push. But they would not have to wait long, because at the start of July, there would be a small window with good weather. The problem was, many expeditions planned to summit at this time, so there would be traffic on the mountain, but not enough to cause any major delays. 
The window would not last long, as a blizzard was predicted to hit the mountain on July 4th, so the men readied themselves and set out towards the summit at the end of May. They all climbed at their own pace and took several days to progress up the mountain, but they did so successfully with little problems. On July 1st, all three Polish climbers had made it to Camp 3 at 6,800 meters and were 1,300 meters away from their goal. Pavel woke up on the morning of July 2nd ready to start his day before the sun had risen. Men and women from various expeditions were already up, getting ready for their own climbs. After a quick bite to eat, Pavel tightened his snow boots and set out, determined to reach the top of Nanga Parbat. The daunting task did not deter him, nor his fellow Polish climbers who were already ahead of him. Pavel was slow to make progress up the peak, but it would not just be him. Almost all of the mountaineers were slow. Many expeditions were suffering due to Camp 4 not being established. Pavel kept moving up the mountain throughout the day as the sun slowly crept across the sky, and finally, at around 3 p.m., he would reach the summit. He was ecstatic that he had accomplished his goal. However, this feeling did not last long due to the weather worsening. Dark clouds began to fill the sky and a drop in temperature signaled bad news. The blizzard had come early. Pavel, already exhausted, knew that he still had a long way to go before safety. Luckily, he would not have to descend alone as one of the other Polish climbers had summited around the same time. They both began their climb together but neither were in good shape. In fact, many climbers that had reached the summit began experiencing issues on their descent. Further down the mountain, a Lithuanian expedition had set up a small Camp 4 at 7,350 meters as they were planning to push for the summit the next day, but that would never happen. Instead, this camp would serve as a medical tent for multiple climbers returning from the summit. As the blizzard moved in, chaos on the mountain ensued. The radio at the makeshift Camp 4 began spewing ominous messages as climbers still descending would periodically pass others needing help. The location and status of these mountaineers were given over the radio in case anybody could answer the call. A member from the Hungary expedition lost his glove and was experiencing extreme frostbite on his hand. An unknown climber was hallucinating, unable to continue, and required a guide. Pavel and the Polish climber with him were both massively struggling. Both men were disoriented, but worst of all, Pavel was suffering from altitude sickness and no longer even knew his name. By midnight, there were still many climbers on the peak, slowly making their way down in the harsh conditions. The small Camp 4 originally set up by the Lithuanian expedition was overrun with mountaineers seeking shelter from the blizzard and requiring first aid. At 1 a.m., a voice over the radio shouted that Pavel was near the small Camp 4, but desperately needed oxygen. It was the other Polish climber with him. Two men, Damilevicius and Velodomir, left their tent and climbed about 200 meters to the location of Pavel. He looked bad, really bad. The men tried to help Pavel to his feet, but his legs just didn't work. Instead, Damilevicius decided to return to Camp 4 to ask for help. On his way down, he ran into another confused climber, who was dragged into camp and taken to a nearby tent. Damilevicius quickly grabbed supplies and tried to enlist whatever help he could find, but sadly, nobody at Camp 4 was in good enough condition to be of assistance. Instead, he requested oxygen and help over the radio. Damilevicius returned back to Pavel and the other climber, hopeful that help would come. Pavel laid in Volodymyr's arms as the men tried to keep Pavel conscious by keeping conversation with him. They heated up some water and forced Pavel to drink. An hour passed, and then another, and their hopes of help coming began to diminish. Realizing that no help was on the way, they tried to move Pavel themselves, but were unable to descend very far, when all of a sudden, Pavel would stop breathing. He would die at 3.19 a.m. in the arms of his fellow mountaineers. Damilevicius and Volodymyr would continue to help climbers for the next five hours. Miraculously, they would all make the trip back to base camp safely together. Many were left frustrated and questioning the decision made by multiple expeditions. If a proper Camp 4 had been set up, the summit push would not have been so difficult, and in turn, the descent would have been much easier as well. But alas, that is not how the story goes. Instead, it is a reminder that expedition planning plays a crucial role in the success of one reaching the summit. And when you are on that peak, don't expect anybody to come and save you.